Mike Holtz, United States Army, Vietnam. Mike served with the 116th Assault Helicopter Company in Vietnam in 1968. As a first lieutenant, he was a helicopter pilot with the Huey Helicopter gunships in and out of landing zones. Remarkable story. He's featured in my film, Vietnam Remembered. Mike was severely wounded in Vietnam and came home to tell his story. I'd like to thank Todd Niswinder for sponsoring this story. Todd, thank you for your support of my work and getting this story out there so many people can hear what Mike went through. My Vietnam film, by the way, focuses on the Air Mobile Division. And Todd, you're helping others to learn more about the helicopter warfare in Vietnam. So God bless you for sponsoring this story. Okay, folks, I interviewed Mike almost 17 years ago, Fruit of Colorado, just west of where I live here in Grand Junction. And it was January 23rd, 2006. So I hope you enjoy this. Share these stories. Subscribe to this channel. Let's keep this thing going, folks. Freedom is not free. Freedom is earned. And we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country today that our veterans fought for. Very, very important that people hear these stories. So let's get them out there and share them. And I thank you for the support that you've given me. Uh, your encouragement, your words of encouragement. I appreciate that. So God bless you for it. So enjoy Mike's story. Let's just start out now. You were with the Army. Yep. And what year did you go to Vietnam? B-68. Okay. And give me your your group, your division, your regiment, uh, company, and all that that you're with in Vietnam. Okay, I went over in August of 68, and I was with the 116th Assault Helicopter Company, and that was stationed at Kuchi, which was uh, west of Saigon. And our sister company was Tay Nan, so we flew missions back and forth along that area between in and uh, we supported a lot of ground troops like the 25th, 101st, 82nd. We were just an assault helicopter, and we had selects, which were the uh, they had the door gunners and some armament, but they were uh, troop carriers. Okay, tell me, um, give me your rank and your MOS at the time. I was a combat engineer, and I went to flight school, so I was uh, sent over as a lieutenant after I went through. Uh, aviation school. I had a short station up at Watertown, New York as a range maintenance waiting for a shipment overseas. And I actually ended up with one of my classmates in Gucci at the same uh, company. Okay, so you were, uh, what was your rank? I, when I get to, got to Vietnam, I was a lo uh, first lieutenant. Okay, and again, your MOS would be first? Combat engineer, but aviation. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Let's just, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes, and I'm just learning more about Vietnam. I've heard a lot of things, but can you tell, were you ever in combat before you went to Vietnam, I mean, in this mm, particular area? No. Okay. Can you just start telling me what it was like when you first got to Vietnam, what you saw, what it smelled like? I mean, what was Vietnam like for you? Well, of course, in, in the Army, we had a lot of training classes, and we were at Fort Rucker, and people talked about some of the instructors that the climate maybe was similar, you know, humid and hot and what to expect when you got to Vietnam. And and I suppose we had movies and talked to people, but you're never really ready until you get there. I mean, it just, there's no way to be prepared for what you actually feel or see when you get there. We flew in on a commercial airline and that, it's been a long time ago, but I think it was Braniff. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had stewardesses and we had meals and it was, a, you know, like this is first class treatment, but as we approached in country, I guess we landed in Saigon, they put out a warning on the radio that there might be ground fire and we were actually flying into a, you know, hostile territory, but nothing really happened there. And then we, uh, our orders were all cut ahead of time, so I ended up in Coochie, which was a, uh, a helicopter base. I started out flying uh, slicks, 
because I was brand new in the country, brand new in the company. Some of the um, pilots had been there one tour, maybe even two tours, warrant officers. And, uh, you know, they start you right out. You just, you just go in and start flying. We were doing uh, hauling troops into LZs. It'd be 6 8 to a ship, or if they were Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, or whatever, there'd be more, maybe 9 or 10. And we were flying um, hotel model Hueys. And, uh, of course, we had our our uh, flak jackets and our seats were bulletproof and we had our helmets, but it didn't take very many days to find out that we were really in the, in the hot country, you know, hot, uh, hot combat area. We were getting shot at as we come into the LZs and I remember my first real awareness of what was going on was getting up and looking and I could see bullets hitting the water and I thought it was our guy shooting out. And I think my uh, pilot said, get your head down, Oates. Those were incoming, you know, and they were right out in front of us. And it was like real awareness, like this thing is real. <laughs> were you a pilot? Yeah. Okay, so you're flying a Huey. Yeah. Man. At that time, I was a co-pilot. That was okay. brand new. I mean, you know, I, I might have got on the stick a little bit. but How, they, how old were you then? Uh, I actually got commissioned at, at 18 out of OCS. And I got in there in August. My birthday was in September, so I probably was, still was 18, maybe you're, 19. I, so you're you're like, <clears throat> do you remember your first missions into the hot, the, the hot LZs you're going into? I wouldn't say that was the very first. I mean, I really don't. I remember we were flying slicks and flying, but I remember that being my first. It might have been the third day or the tenth day, but mm -hmm. I remember the incoming, you know, the uh, bullets. And then, you know, I was there a short time. It was like two and a half, three months, so... We were flying a lot of hours per day. <clears throat> Seemed like from morning to night, and even night missions. And we'd eat in the plane or uh, sea rations. And uh, you know, I was getting a lot of air time. I was getting logging up a lot of flight time, which was good. And I had some other duties. I was a payroll officer. I was uh, in charge of recreation. Uh, that was kind of a fluke. That was a funny little story. They found out I was a combat en engineer in the. Uh, CEO or the executive officer wanted a swimming pool. So he said, Oates, you're in charge of making this company a swimming pool. So, so on one of our missions that we were down at Vung Tau, I found some concrete that was belonged to the Navy, called in for eight or 10 slicks. We loaded it up, took it back, and used that to make the uh, swimming pool. I had a neighboring company come over, an engineer company, and they dug out a big trench, like an inch leach pit, like we do back on the farm. And then we had the Vietnamese that came into work. We'd had them square off the ends, and then we got a bladder, rubber bladder, and then we put the concrete. I never saw it finished. I uh, had some people send me pictures of it, but it was an Olympic-sized swimming pool. I guess it was finished to that size. Yeah, I got hit before I saw the finished product. Tell me about <coughs> the, the Huey, um, as far as uh, as the workhorse in Vietnam and the missions and the things you did with the Huey helicopters, and then just tell me about... Uh, you know, the sound of the Huey. But tell me about the, 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 the helicopters in general. What was what you guys use it for? Well, like say, we were an assault company, 116th Assault. So our mission was really to uh, drop in troops in an LZ. And we even come by sort of accident, a smoky ship that would circle the LZ and throw up a smoke screen. And then the gunships would do a pre-run and hit the perimeters or the uh, brush lines, or whatever, in case there was hostile fire trying to, uh, you know, watch for the ships to come in so they didn't draw all the fire. You know, and it, uh, they wised up to it pretty quick. I mean, they, even, they they learned how to lead the helicopters and you're always getting shot at and and hit in the helicopter. And I saw a helicopter right next to me, a guy that went to aviation school, got hit right in the head, you know, and that was his end right there. And, uh, Every day, you know, or just about every day, you come back, there'd be somebody that it was a casualty or sent back home. And ironic enough, even though my chopper been hit sometimes, uh, I never got any injuries whatsoever except in uh, base camp. And the night that I got hit, a rocket came through my uh, hooch, my barracks, and it had a galvanized roof, and it just splattered that. And so 
between the fragments and the shrapnel is what splattered me. And my roommate was gone. Luckily, it blew his bed completely apart. Can you describe that? We kind of jumped ahead a bit, but go ahead and describe what actually happened to you physically, where, where, where you were hit and all that. Describe the incident again. Well, it was late at night. It was, uh, I'd been to the officer's club. It was like 9 or 10, and I'd went back to the barracks and just got an incoming round. There were other rounds came into the base camp, and I don't know how many casualties were done that night because I was pretty much in shock. It, I was laying down sleeping and it just knocked me basically out of bed and I uh, was bleeding bad in the throat. So I r sort of remember sticking my finger into trying to get air. My windpipe was cut and I had a piece of shrapnel about the size of a pack of cigarettes stuck right there. And I sort of limped or walked down the uh, boardwalk to another hooch and there was another major that saw me, grabbed me, wrapped me in a sheet, and luckily we had a medical team right there on base camp. So I don't know how long, it's no way of knowing the amount of time that passed. If I'd have been out in the field, I probably wouldn't have made it, but luckily we had quick medical attention. And I remember starting to work on me, and it uh, seemed like I was kind of up above looking down at him, but you know, over that many years, I guess you don't know. But I ended up with a lot of uh, shrapnel. I had like 40 pieces just splattered me and uh, they were able to stabilize me and several days later I think they picked me on a stretcher and I went to Saigon and to Tokyo mm -hmm. spent some time there and then went to Travis Air Force Base and then ended up in Fitzsimmons for several years until I did a lot of reconstructive surgery. Back in Vietnam Mike now the Huey helicopters, did you use them for medevacs or just taking troops in? Or when you pulled troops out, were they wounded? Tell me about, just walk me through that. Take me back and walk me through that. Everything they needed for a helicopter, it could be anything. It could be just taking supplies out or dropping in troops or the gun rooms or medevac out. I mean, they were the workhorse. They did, you know, the, 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 the troops that I talked to later in the hospital, the uh, platoon leaders and and guys were on the ground. When I stationed Fitzsimmons, they just really depended on us in the air. I mean, we were, uh, at the time, we knew we were doing what we were supposed to be doing, but they really, I mean, when they heard that wop and wop, it was like their savior or their rescue or their help or whatever. I mean, we were jack of all trades, I guess, except recreation. I mean, you didn't have time for any recreation. Can you describe to me a, 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 a situation where there was combat and where you went in and did you, did you drop down? Did you hover? Did, were wounded put aboard the Huey? Tell me about some of those times. Did you see any of that? A typical mission would be like, say, we'd do the gun run ahead of time if we thought it was needed. And then five, six, seven choppers would drop in the troops, six, seven, eight to a, a ship. And they would do the landing. They would do a, a fast approach mm -hmm. and uh, come into an LZ. Mm -hmm. Everybody would unload. And then the choppers would take out. And it depends on how far we, away we were. We'd go back to camp and get fuel, or maybe bring, go get other troops and bring them in. Depends on what their mission was or how many troops they needed on that particular mission. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if there were wounded, they would call back, and there was regular medevac, but a lot of times there weren't enough ships for medevac, so they would, again, call the slicks back in to carry out the wounded and then take them to the closest base camp for medical attention. You remember that, or was it like a surrealistic type of a situation? I mean, when you're actually in combat and, and they're shooting and there's wounded and people getting wounded or dying, I mean, are they shooting at the wounded as they're getting on board the Hueys? I mean, what's going on? Well, yeah, it's it's going so fast, and I don't say you get used to it, but like I say, when you're first there, it's just you're blown away by what's going on. But after you've done it a while, it's uh, you know what's expected and what you're going to do. I mean, you're going to go into that LZ, it didn't take me very long to realize that I wanted to be in gunships rather than just the Hueys. So I put in for it, and uh, because I did have commission grade, I think they needed a platoon leader, so I was assigned to the gunships. Maybe even had some warrant officer that had more time in there, but I felt better about it. If I was going to be in the war, at least I was in a gunship able to do something back. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of our gun runs, you know, we just hit a perimeter and fire off the uh, grenade launchers or the rockets or the machine gun and prep the area, you know, so that our troops wouldn't get hammered any worse than they had to be. But usually those, 
you know, the Vietnamese wised up. They knew that we were coming to do that, so maybe they were, we wouldn't draw any fire. And they would wait till the slicks came in. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned the Smoky ship. I don't know that it was actually our company that did it, but there was a ship that was not running real well that was throwing out a lot of smoke at a bad injector or something. And we end up doing other ships that way and we'd go in and make a, a round circle around the LZ and throw up a smoke screen, which was kind of a suicide run. You actually even drew straws to get it because it would draw fire. I mean, they when they found out what it was doing, they'd try to put it out of commission. Sure. Um, now, you you mentioned the Huey making a wop-wop sound. I mean, one blade, is that what it is? Well, no, it's two blades, but when you uh, change it, it's wop 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 in it. And then the air density changes, like at noon or 1 or 2 o'clock, mm-hmm. you would get a, a lower density, and we'd have to uh, maybe go get fuel and and try to be up in the air because it's harder to stay up. You don't have the hover factor, and you're loaded heavy. And at, you know, 12, 1, 2 o'clock, it just, you don't want to be on the ground anymore, and you have to be. So it's harder to make your approaches. Now, you were a, cu- a co-pilot at first, and then yeah. you, got, you were... You became a pilot then? I was a co-pilot for, uh, for, in the slicks and then went uh, in into the guns and then actually was a co-pilot in the guns with the, somebody who'd been in more time. But by the time I got to gunships, I was actually doing a lot of flight time, okay. a lot of stick time. Okay. There's two of you in the front and, you know, one's doing the flying, one's doing a lot of the talking. You got, you know, uh, earphones on, you're listening to several different channels, trying to, uh, you know, keep up with what you're doing. and. Then, Another channel, maybe uh, what's going on on the ground, or can you can you remember and tell me what some of the radio communications was? I mean, you using codes or names or colors. I mean, what do you what do you are you saying, Joe, Bob? I mean, how are you guys talking? Oh boy, that's been a long time ago. Uh, Identifying yourself, whatever. Uh, pretty much just talk about what you're doing, like uh, squad leader. Some people had nicknames, or you know, like Wasp sixty eight or a Hornet. I think uh, uh, my ship had a was it Hornets? I had a plaque around here. It was Hornet 66 maybe or something. Mm-hmm. So you would have a call sign or a name, and you would talk to other ships under those same. So now as a, tell me about the, the crew on the ship. Who, if there's a gunner, tell me about the crew on, the, on these. Well, on the slicks, you had a gunner on each side in the back, door gunners, a crew chief and a door gunner. And then on the uh, gunships, usually you would have that too, but... Sometimes I think that we probably only had one or two in the back because we had a lot of other armament. We had rockets, uh, machine guns, grenade launchers. You know, if you were completely full with everything, well, it's, it made you fairly fairly heavy. Mm-hmm. You know, you try to get out early in the morning. And and then coming in, I remember when we first started, we um, there was a tank or something out in there. We'd fire practice rounds at it to come in and, you know, uh, like it in the evening or the afternoon to, you know, to slide in. Mm-hmm. I know this is a kind of a foolish question, but just because a lot of people don't know um, a lot about Vietnam, but tell me who were fighting in Vietnam. Well, the South Vietnamese were our allies, and then we were fighting the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong were, uh, you know, the local rebels or whatever. They, uh, I don't know, You, when you're at that age going over there, like, say so you're not prepared what's going on. It's just kind of what you're sent there to do your job. And really, I don't think anybody's aware of what was going on until maybe even after it was over with. Uh, I know there were at times that I felt, and I'm sure other people did too, that we were kind of, well, I used to play basketball like we were fighting half court. You know, we'd uh, hit supply lines, have three or four days of, of hitting active areas and maybe they would call us back for a day it was almost like giving them a chance to regroup or some of us felt that way maybe it was you know they had their own reasons for doing things but uh and then some of the people been there a long time said well we could win this thing in a week we'll just blow it up and black top it and no doubt we had the arm stuff to do that but that wasn't the way the war was being fought and uh it was a different kind of war I don't know what the actual number came out after it was all over, but I remember hearing my dad talk about hundreds of thousands of troops being killed in World War II, and I think basically Vietnam, we probably lost, what, 50, 60, 70,000. So it was a different kind of war. 
But it was very extreme at the time. I mean, the Tet Offensive was in 68. And uh, the people on the ground, you know, they really had it tough. Some of them, I mean, they were right out in the middle of the action. Uh, even though we were vulnerable in the air, it was some safety margin. We weren't in the hand-to-hand -hand combat or in the muck and the dirt and the heat. And we had a as nice a job as I guess you could get being as you were there. <laughs> None of it was good, but it was better than being in the other place. Yeah. I'm very intrigued by the Huey helicopter. In World War II, they used the Higgins landing boats that took the troops into the beaches and stuff, and that was the transportation for the troops. And you flying into an LZ um, in and out, I mean, to me, it, the Huey is a counterpart to what those Higgins boats were doing. So um, what, what was the mood of some of these troops going into these areas? Were they scared? Were they gung-ho, invincible? What do you think? How did you describe that? Well, both. I mean. The ones who were gung-ho had probably had some time there, or maybe it was a little bit of a facade, but a lot of them were scared to death. I mean, they were brand new, young in the country, and, you know, especially on their first few missions. I mean, you can imagine coming in, the, the flight probably scared them, and then to drop into an LZ and being fired up on probably being my age at 18 or 19 years old, I mean, it was petrifying. They had, you know, they were dropped into a hot LZ. Anybody would react the same way. And maybe the gung-ho ones, you know, just to become a, accustomed to it after a month or six months or some of them were on second tours. Uh, well, did, was there this feeling like with them, some of the World War II guys, they felt invincible until they started shooting at them and then they realized this is real. I mean, is that kind of baptism under fire type thing? Well, you saw people next to you being injured or killed and I, I think everybody, even nowadays human nature is, it happens to the next guy. It won't happen to me. It was real eye-opening to me when I woke up in the hospital a month later, realized that I was, well, I was alive, but that I'd been hit. Because you always think it's gonna to happen to the next guy. You know, I'm lucky I even woke up probably. You know, that could have been the end of the whole show, so. Uh, you realize real quick that you're not invincible. You just, your number's up. You know, and I, uh, thank God it wasn't, because I've sure enjoyed life since that, but uh, it was real close either way. Tell me about anybody you knew. You, you mentioned maybe your friends or people you knew that were actual friends or people you knew killed or wounded in, in combat while you're going in and out. Do you remember any incidents? Classmates, yeah. I could say, you know, as much of a friend as you can get with a classmate, you spend time with them. In, uh, in flight school, of course, there's maybe 100 or 200 other ones, but you become friends with half a dozen or a dozen real good ones, and the others are acquaintances. And I don't remember the names now. I probably shut it out of my mind, but... We started out in Fort Bliss flying the uh, Hiller, which was pretty much mechanical, but at the time we were in training, so it seemed like a great little helicopter. And then we went into the Bell, which was in Fort Rucker for advanced training. So the Huey, by the time we got to the Huey, it was, what a ship. It was hydraulic, it was big, turbine. I mean, what a piece of equipment. Matter of fact, when I got out of the Army, I bought a Bell turbo at my ranch in Gunnison, just because I had such a love for the, for the helicopter. Tried to fly fixed wing a little bit and just never got the feel for it and my mind didn't work in the right direction to fly fixed wing, so I thought I better stay with the helicopter. But the UEI yeah, I was actually going to go into the Cobras at the first year. I'd taken a couple uh, flights in them and I got hit in the first part of November so I didn't make it to the Cobra. I would have loved to have flown that machine more. It was just two pilots, pilot and pilot lined up, really a uh, hard assault machine. And then later they had some other helicopters that really got advanced even nowadays, but you know, no way to go back. And I see them at flight shows or uh, air shows or whatever, but never really had a chance to fly those. So you lost some friends. Yeah, I, I remember after being there maybe only a month, like I say, just one of the ships off to my left, got it, we caught it on the radio that Lieutenant uh, if I thought about it, I could probably think had been hit, and come to find out he'd been shot right in the head. And then I met a guy in uh, Fitz Simmons that had been hit with a 50 caliber in the jaw, and he was, I didn't know him at the time, but I met him in Fitz Simmons. I, some of my better friends I met when I was actually stationed at Fitz Simmons. You know, we, we got stationed there for six months to a year to get repaired, and some of my best friends I still keep contact with that I met in Fitz Simmons. Had one visit me here last summer. Captain Joel Maine, 
and had another Captain Wagger coming up at my ranch and gun us some years back. Did you see the movie We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson? Came yeah, I believe so. About the Yai Drain Valley battle in 65, helicopters, the first time they really used helicopters in Vietnam. Was Vietnam anything like that? I mean, I know Hollywood glamorizes it, but was there any, any part of that movie that maybe you could say that was realistic as far as the, the, the helicopter part? Yeah, they were. Um, you know, there's a lot of movies come out after Vietnam. There was Hamburger Hill, and they, uh, we were sh soldiers, and uh, uh, do any the deer, do, deer Hunter, yeah, some of those. Do any of them do justice to what life was really like? Or? Yeah, they may have been Hollywood up a little bit, but then maybe in a lot of cases they weren't, they probably didn't really get into as deep as it was. Yeah. I remember the Kelly incident, and that was, that was probably a real thing that was going on, you know, but he got caught on the on the pedestal and they uh, probably made an example of him, but the real war was going on. There were people being killed, there were be pe people being shot, and there was, like I said, a lot more action on the ground that we never even got to see. Mm -hmm. You're up a couple hundred feet and you're firing into the brush, you know somebody's gonna get wounded or killed, but when you're on the ground, you're hand to hand or 15 or 20 feet, you know it's really happening. Does anything today r trigger or remind you of Vietnam? What if you hear a the St. Mary's helicopter, does anything remind oh, you of, what do you think about it? Any helicopter I can hear, at any time a helicopter goes by, a seismograph, St. Mary's, yeah, it's, it's instantly that wop wop. And like I say, I was hit sleeping, so a loud noise like a backfire or a shot, it's sudden alertness. I still don't sleep real well, and I don't know whether to blame that on it, but I'm up two or three times during the middle of the night. Any noise, I'm a very light sleeper. Uh, I don't dwell on those movies. I've seen them. I don't go back and see them more than once. Uh, took me a while to get to where I wanted to see them. Still don't really want to see them. I've just kind of accident up on a couple of them, so I wouldn't seek out and go rent one on purpose. Yeah. Were you shooting, firing as a pilot or co-pilot? Were you? Had to... Yeah, it's actually in your joystick. You actually had the trigger and you fired and had a grenade launcher and fired off your rockets. Yeah, you actually fired. Did you have to do that? Oh yeah. Coming in to an NLZ or what? Well, that's, yeah, I've got pictures over my album where it shows us coming in and the rockets are coming out off both sides, hitting the brush line or the tree line or the river bank. And then you had your machine gun where you could trigger it and your door gunners, if they were there, they were, you know, shooting from the sides. Yeah, actually we'd, uh, one, you could be flying and shooting both or you could be, uh, the other guy could be flying and you do do the shooting or, you know, you did both. Did you ever see the Viet Cong or did you, when you were shooting at him, or did you see him at all during your time? Oh, yeah, you'd see him, yeah. A lot of times, uh, you didn't really know who they were. I mean, you'd see people on the ground, and if they saw you coming, they might drop what they were doing, like in a field, drop a hoe or a rake or whatever they had, or shovel, and then grab a gun and... I remember one instance, we had a field, new field commander coming in, and he was in my ship in the back, and... That must have been when I was flying slicks, and I had a senior warrant officer with me, I believe. He said, we're in the friendly territory now, and the warrant officer said, no, sir, we're not. We had fire here a couple days ago, and he said, no, according to my records, I think the uh, warrant officer kind of winked back at the crew chief, and he threw out a sea ration peanut butter can or cheese can, and they saw that coming down, probably thinking it was a grenade or something or whatever, I don't know. And man, they grabbed their rifles and started firing and we got out of there and the field commander was upset about that saying that I was led to believe this was a friendly territory and we're getting fired at but I think they were every place I mean they just there were hostels right in with scattered throughout maybe even the people on the ground didn't know sometimes who they were. Describe the, the LZ and a hot LZ um, if you touch down, if the troops jump off, just, just a screw, take me in on a landing on it. Is it hot LZ? Do they have to clear the path, or is it already cleared out, or what do you have? Well, you tried to clear the path. I mean, it was picked out by the people on the ground and sent up a smoke signal, you know, red or blue or yellow, and then uh, you would land, and a lot of times it'd be in water, and so maybe you wouldn't completely set down. Uh, you know, the water, I'd see him jump out the water, maybe would be six inches to a foot, a uh, foot and a half deep. And uh, then other times it'd be on just regular, regular ground, but right around the area we were at, a lot of it was flat land and, uh, and water, the rice paddies. Mm -hmm. 
And then if you went further north, uh, we did support some other areas, but they were kind of vague. I remember going on some of them, but basically we went between Coochie and Tainan. Is it a tense moment when you're landing in a hot LC? Well, yeah, and you sometimes you really never know it's going to be hot until you get into it. I mean, you're hoping everyone is not, and maybe two or three or four in a row will be. It's kind of like the lottery. You don't know which, which when you're going to get the number. Is it like a pink, pink, pink when they're hitting the side of the helicopter? How many pink, pinks can a helicopter take before it's shot down? Well, it depends on what it hits. If it's a hydraulic hose or something like that, or, you know, it's it take you right down. Uh, I remember coming back and not even knowing we'd been hit until we got out back to base camp and seeing bullet holes in the tail section through the sheet metal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and actually, I don't ever remember having anything come through the bubble when I was flying. So, like you say, you always think it's gonna happen next guy. So, really, I never had anybody hit in the back of my ship or in the bubble, but we did have those bullet holes in the uh, tail section. That, were, were there, was there ever an incident where anybody on the, on the actual helicopter was shot while you were taking off or landing that was actually in the helicopter? Do you remember anything like that? That the classmate I said he was hit. We were going into an LZ. Yeah, I got the radio report right there and never saw him after that. I mean, he was killed right then. Shot right in the head. <clears throat> what kind of weapons are firing back at you? AK-47s? Uh, probably, yeah. Our troops had M-16s, but uh, the AR-15, mm -hmm. 223. And so the South Vietnamese sometimes they had, you know, there'd be uh, more of them, and they would have the same weapons that our troops had. And they were they didn't weigh as much, so we could carry more of them. But a lot of times it'd be mixed, partly them and partly the the American troops with them. And we uh, we even got up towards you know the Cambodian border. And uh, seems like one time I remember a ship went down, must have been right at the border. So we were sent back with uh, gold white phosphorus or Willie Peter rounds and destroyed it on ground because it was unfeasible to get it out of it was in such a bad area that we just didn't want them to get it so it was destroyed on the ground tell me about the camaraderie with the other guys was there a camaraderie that you guys shared a bond yeah uh, some guys I remember one of the warrant officers it seemed like he was always just halfway out of it he was probably just petrified and he's whole soul and he'd been there for a while and I think you know he probably smoked marijuana a lot and uh, he was a good pilot but I think he was just kind of out there all the time probably just trying to handle the situation basically everybody was pretty straight and scared enough that you paid a lot of attention to detail you didn't want any mistakes uh, and when you come back of course we flew so many hours usually didn't have much time for social events or recreation. I mean, you just ate and went back to bed. You might go to the old club for a little bit, or I remember twice going to the NCO club with my uh, some of my crews. You know, they had a show in from Korea or something, but you just didn't have a lot of time. You just had too many hours, and too many duties, and, and which was good. It kept you busy. Time went fast. Tell me about the drug usage in Vietnam, what you know, and how that affected the, the war that you were in. Uh, on the ground, I just heard from other people saying that, you know, it was probably more used uh, flying. I, I only remember those couple incidents where those guys, they, uh, you're in control of a half million dollar piece of equipment, first of all, and, and you're going out there in the air, you don't want to make a mistake. So unless it was hidden a lot, nobody that I would fly next to or whatever, I saw it. But I do think that one little warrant officer was probably a little out of it at times. He just... He'd be late to the flight line, didn't want to go, uh, probably didn't get on the stick for the first hour or two. Maybe the other guy would know that something was wrong with him, but I'm sure he was just petrified. How did you feel as a pilot on a Huey going into combat? Was there any glamour or glory to that, or was it just a job, or was it an adventure like the Army makes it look like? Or What were your thoughts then about all that that was happening around you? Did you think someday you'd be, you know, what do you think? I wanted to become a warrant officer and fly, and that's why I went to the Army. Uh, I looked at the Air Force, but that would have been a long haul. When I got to AIT, I'd qualified where I could go to OCS, and they, that would take longer to go in country, and I'd get probably more money and get some rank, so I tried. I did that, still wanting to fly. 
And so I, I wanted to fly the helicopter. You know, I'd, originally I, th I thought I'd just become a warrant officer, but when I got the commission, it was a little more money. But yeah, I had a real desire to fly the helicopter. It wasn't something that they made me do. I mean, I put in for it and worked to get it. Were you ever conscious of the fact that I'm serving my country, I'm fighting for the flag and people's freedoms? Do you ever think like that? Well, yeah, we thought we were doing a good thing and we were uh, gung-ho as far as getting over there and fighting. You know, I had other friends that their big brother had come back and be in Vietnam, so it was like I enlisted. Uh, sounds foolish now that I would want to go to Vietnam, but I was 17 and enlisted with two other friends and, and knew that I would go to Vietnam and I knew I wanted to fly. So, uh, and once you got there, like you said, it was, I'm up here and, and I'm flying a helicopter and we're going to protect those guys on the ground and we're going to do our job and I'm sure glad I'm up here instead of down there and yeah, we're doing, you know, we're doing a good thing here. We're doing what we're supposed to do and let's do it the best we can. Tell me about the homecoming you had when you came back. Was there a homecoming? <laughs> Explain, tell me what happened. I want to hear it. Well, no, I was, it was. There was no homecoming. First of all, I was in the hospital. Uh, I've heard other people talk about that, that there was nobody to meet him off the plane or no parades, but that was the kind of war it was. I remember a guy in Gunnison sobbing over the over a beer that nobody came to the airport, and he was actually in supply or something. I said, just get it out of your system, because just kind of war it was. But no, I uh, my folks lived in Debeck, so I think they were probably there when I got to Fitzsimmons in Denver. My mom was just, you know, bewildered the fact that I was, I lost a lot of weight. I weigh about 210 now and I weighed 210 or 215 when I got out of AIT and I was all muscle then. Unfortunately, it's not muscle now, but when I got hit, I couldn't uh, eat. I'd take everything through uh, uh, tubes in my nose. So on my first leave, I remember going to a basketball game in my hometown and I weighed 128 pounds. From, from 215 pounds. And I had a trach, so I couldn't talk. I was just skin and bones, but I was alive. Uh, you, there's a, a period when bitterness sets in. I mean, I guess that you're the one that got hit or whatever, but eventually, you know, you figure that there's a blessing in that too, because you could have been dead or a lot worse off than. I saw some real bad cases in the hospital, and. I consider myself real lucky. But uh, when you're actually over there doing it, yeah, it was, I'm sure the guys who went for a second tour must have felt more of that or they wouldn't have put in for the second tour. And like I said, some of them probably were just young old, but the, the short amount of time that I was there, I was intrigued by it, thought I was doing what I was supposed to be doing for my country. Uncle Sam had sent me over there and I wanted to do it the best I could. And I wouldn't say I was eager to do it, but I got up knowing I was going to do it, and it wasn't dragging my feet. Uh, you're anxious probably in a good sense and a bad sense. You're anxious because of what might happen, but you're also anxious to get in to start doing it. I asked all the World War II guys this question, and I'm going to ask you as a Vietnam veteran, but and kind of follow up to some of the questions I've asked you, but you know, what does freedom mean to you? I mean, having fought in Vietnam, been injured, what, what does freedom mean to you, Mike? Well, I don't know if we accomplished everything we were supposed to in that particular war, but other wars, that's what we, you know, that's what we're fighting for. And I think a lot of people may take that for granted. Uh, unless you're there at first-hand experience, there's a lot of sacrifices that are put out for that war of freedom, which is a, uh, is a cause. And then over eons and all the history, you know, it's, it's been there. We are a free country. And then in World War II, like I say, there were so many killed in that same sense of freedom, but every war is fought differently, you know, even Desert Storm. So as long as we got to keep doing it, but uh, I do think a lot of people do take it for granted. I, I don't think the the veterans do. I mean, I don't care what aspect they're at. Maybe they don't even see the action, but they, they're there putting in their tally in their day, and they're making their sacrifices. They're away from their families. They're out of society for that period of time. I think a lot of times they're under underappreciated. There's a lot of good things coming out now. I think uh, there's a lot of good programs and there's retraining. There's good medical and that are for the benefit of the veterans, which I'm glad to see. Not for myself, but just for the the whole 
which the people out there that do need it. What you were wounded, you saw others wounded and killed, Mike. What does what tell me about the price for freedom? Well, when I was more conscious in Fitzsimmons is where I really saw the uh, the tally of the war. I mean, it was young husband and wife, and he would be amputated or amputeed and tore up inside or die on the bed next to me, and that was where you really saw the cost of war, the destruction of what it did to the human lives. And, you know, that was only just a, a tinge of it because there was so much more that that was just in one hospital. That was Fitzsimmons in Denver, which was a, a big hospital. And I became friends with some of those guys, but even after they got out, if I look back, half of those guys are dead right now. They just never did readjust. They uh, they had a lot of divorces. They had uh, a lot of financial problems, uh, a lot of drinking, uh, drugs, suicides. I mean, they just... A lot of them just didn't, didn't come out of it right. You know, a lot of psychological problems. But what's the cause of that? Did they not get the help they wanted? I mean, why, were, why, did, why did some of them come back messed up? Well, different reasons. Some of them, I guess, every individual adjusts to the uh, situation differently, and it's just hard to put it all behind you. And a lot of them were crying over, like say the guy crying over his beer about no homecoming, or, or maybe they... Maybe they got a wrong attitude towards other people by being in the military. I don't know. It's there's. I don't think there's any one one or two things you can say on that. They just. It's hard to adjust when you get back, and there just probably aren't enough programs or enough knowledge on how to get them to adjust. I know a lot of officers that were uh, wounded that just over the last 20 years that I found out that just didn't make it. They died of alcoholism or suicides or uh, or bad medical problems. You think there was a, such a difference between World War II and Vietnam to where the Vietnam vets did suffer like that? They did commit suicide and all the drinking problems? I mean, it seems like there was a different generation. I think World War II was, you know, maybe the whole country dived into it more so there wasn't the conflict of whether it was right or wrong. So maybe they didn't have that adjustment. I mean, there probably were more flag-waving ceremony parades for the World War II veterans, but I wouldn't blame that completely on it. Like, say, the uh, the mass of destruction and death in the World War II was so much more than Vietnam, but percentage-wise, it I don't think the Vietnam guys adjusted as well, but... Do uh, you think the drugs had anything to do with why a lot of them were messed up? It might, yeah, it might have been drugs. I don't know if it, they come and contact with it in the military or that was the error that when they got out I mean marijuana was a big thing back in that era and maybe it wasn't World War II and alcohol it probably was both so uh, I don't know maybe it's our society I don't know there's no way to I, I try not to get too deep into it I just try to do a soul survivorship and mm -hmm. maybe that's the wrong way to look at it but you kind of got to do it on your own and Tell me why Vietnam is referred to as an unpopular war. What does that mean? Well, there was a lot of peace movements back in that time. And, you know, if I had to look back at it again, I mean, some people avoided the draft and they went to Canada. And if I'd had a son, I mean, at this point, looking back at how it was, would you, would you tell your son to go to Vietnam if you had that way to look back? Or would you tell him to go to Canada? I mean, it, there's a lot of things I didn't agree with the war either, but... Uh, it was a war, and that's we got ourselves into it, and that's what we were. So I don't know; it'd be a tough decision. It's a. It was an unpopular war. It probably still is. It's a. You know, the public. It was probably a mixed reaction. You didn't know if somebody's gonna shake your hand or punch at you because you were there. Uh, yeah, it was. A, it was a different, different kind of war. I'm glad I was young, so I didn't probably know any better. At 18 or 19, you really don't know that much. You just kind of do what you're told to do. Mike, tell me, what does the American flag mean to you today? Oh, it's it's a symbol of what we stand for. I mean, there's been a lot of sacrifices for it. It's a, I'm glad I'm here and not in a different country. There's a lot of other areas over there that they don't have even a chance of what we appreciate here. I mean, to live in this society and to walk out and get in your car and drive and go pretty much where you want. I go to Mexico a couple times a year. 
and that's somewhat limited compared to here. There's border patrols, and they have a different attitude. I mean, we really are free here. People don't maybe know it all the time. We have more freedom here than any place I've ever been. I've been to New Zealand and Australia and Canada and Mexico, and there are the free parts of the world, but we really have the best of everything here. And uh, if that's what it took to get that, then everything was worth it. Maybe not to the families that suffered more, but you know, I consider myself very lucky to be here, so it's, it's behind me. Why do you think you survived and lived through Vietnam? A lot of men didn't. I mean, do you ever, do, does that ever bother you? Yeah, you always think about it. You always wonder why you know, your number's up or why it's not up. I mean, I have friends every day, or people I know, acquaintances, that either have heart attacks or cancer or die. Seems like at my age now there's more funerals and more death you really don't think about when you're 20, 30, and 40. Now you're more aware of it. But you also know that you're vulnerable and that, uh, especially after being in a situation like that, that you know, if I had a heart attack tomorrow, uh, that's just the way it goes. But I would also consider myself that I was dead back then, so I've had a blessing of, uh, what, 30, 40 years? That was 68, so a little shy of 40 years. So I, for some odd miracle, I got blessed with that other 40 years. I got a second chance, and uh, a lot of guys didn't. And maybe they were wounded worse or not wounded or dead or whatever, but you know, I would hope that they would realize what just being able to breathe, that they, uh, that's why it's such a shame the ones that came back that had the opportunity that didn't make it just because of an adjustment. That's a, that's a sadness. That's almost as bad as the actual happening over there. If they're put together through a lot of expense and a lot of doctors at a military base and they go three or four years of retrain, they're getting disability and pension and they still can't make it, that that's, seems like a waste. Seems like a human waste. It was a price of war over there that they didn't, but it's a shame to see it happen after the, you know, after the game's called. Mike, are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran, your service to our country? I don't gloat on it. I don't usually don't talk about it, uh, but I'm not ashamed of it. Yeah, I'm proud, but I, very few people know about it. It doesn't come up in normal conversations. Uh, Why? I don't think our society just really wants to deal with it or it's not, like I said, it wasn't a popular war, but you know, the people that do knew once in a while, they'll, even like this, it's, I didn't have a reluctance to do it, but I didn't seek it out to have it done because it's something that you do want to put behind you, but at the same time, no, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm glad that I was, I don't, it's hard to say I'm glad I was there because maybe things would have been a lot different, but I was there, so I'm glad that I am here now in the shape that I'm in, and I'm not ashamed that I did it. I uh, I have remorse about maybe some of the things that I had to do there. Don't even know to some extent what I did do. Uh, being in the air and firing rounds, I mean, I'm sure there was damages done. I saw hooches and villages destroyed, so I'm sure there were, you know, there was a cost to that. And I, I don't like to thank or remember that part of it, but that's that's part of the war. That's what we were called to do. That's one thing about the Army, I mean, you do what you're told to do. Right, wrong, and different, you do it. If it's wrong, you deal with it later. And I remember the old saying, it's better to make a wrong decision quick than it was a right one too late. So that's especially true in combat. That's good. Do you, don't want, do you want people to know you're a Vietnam veteran? Uh, I don't think it makes any difference one way or the other. It's, if they do, that's fine, but you know, I wouldn't go out and publicize it, but at the same time, it's, I don't think it would cost me any uh, embarrassment or uh, bad feelings. Or, I mean, I would hope that if people knew about it, they wouldn't come and burn my house or throw rocks at me, but I think it's way past that, I think. I think we're 40 years down the road. Maybe the first five years, it would have been a lot more unpopular, but a lot of people my age and the people I know, they were, in the military, so that, you know, they're appreciative. They probably have the same feelings. Has anybody ever thanked you for your service in Vietnam? <laughs> well, no, probably not exactly like that. Not just come up and shake your hand. There are some appreciation functions and stuff, but, and the Fruta has a new uh, center out here that's got the, 
the chopper. I'm, I'm glad I'm in the town that has it. That's nice to see that Huey come in. And there's been some appreciation on, done on that, so. Yeah, I am. Uh, like I said, I'm very intrigued by your story and what you shared. Why, why do you think you, you're talking to me today? I mean, what, what kind of prompted you? Why, why, are we, why are you talking to me today? Well, I, there was a, a, a guy that I knew uh, that you also knew that was really intrigued by it, and he's always been intrigued by it, and, and he probably has talked to me about it as much as anybody has, Bobby Telford. And so when he asked me, I said, well, sure, you know, if it, if it goes someplace and it helps somebody and people want to know about it, I'd be willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was always, every time we'd get together, he wanted to know more about it. He just had an, an, an intrigue with it, which mm -hmm. the common people out there don't, they probably don't think any more about it than watching a, an hour movie on TV. What do you hope comes from your interview today and who do you want this to reach? I think the biggest thing I would like to see it help or see come out of it would be, uh, like say, the misfortunate ones that actually got back that couldn't make it later on. And then maybe the higher echelons to know that the next time we get into a situation like that, that maybe some things could be done different. I mean, maybe a different, I don't know. Like I say, I'm glad I was young because mm -hmm. even at this age, I don't, it was just, I was told to do a certain thing, that's what you did. But if it was wrong at that time when we did it, whose fault is that? I mean, maybe somebody up, a little higher up should have known different. Do mm -hmm. uh, you think it's important that we remember and our, our young people remember about war? I mean, things that happened? Well, yeah, because you don't want all the young people to say that because of that war that my kid's not going or I'm not joining up or I'm not going to the military. You can't have a breakdown like that. But when we went in, call it immaturity or stupid or whatever or just ignorance, but we wanted to go. I mean, my dad was in the World War II. He was a paratrooper. So it was a commendable, honorable thing to do was to go to the military. Even though there was a lot of people at that time that felt that was wrong, my upbringing and stuff, it was commendable. And you, you got to have that feeling because we don't want to have a breakdown in the uh, military strength or we won't have our freedom forever. We don't want to be taken over by a, a third power. I mean, <laughs> some people say we are anyway through finances and whatever. I mean, we're getting bought up, but we sure don't want to have a hostile takeover. So I think it's important for the youth to know that not every one of them has to go to the army or the draft, but if a situation arises, not to have a bad feeling. I think they need to know that the, the veterans that were actually in these wars don't all have a bad feeling for it, even if they weren't all done exactly, maybe perfect. Did you know what was going on on the home front when you guys were in Vietnam? Not so much, you know, maybe through some songs or music or attitudes, but we really didn't have a lot of contact with the civilians. We went at 17, it was all military contact. And if there were the few that were older than me that had different viewpoints, they really didn't get a chance to, you were so busy, I mean, you were, Basic training, AIT, OCS was six months. It was the hardest training I ever imagined. I mean, it was daylight to dark, nighttime. It was everything they ever said it was. You know, their Marine boot camp probably was worse or a Navy SEAL training, but OCS was a tough training. And uh, probably had a lot of reasons for it being tough, but uh, you just didn't have time. It was eat, if you had a chance to eat, sleep, and next day, do it all over again. And they wanted you to be ready for that when you got in country, I guess, which was good. You didn't want to be sitting there thinking about what might happen tomorrow or waiting out the week for what might happen or seeing somebody that didn't come back. I mean, you just hit the deck running and did it, and that was probably a good way to do it. Did you guys listen to Creedence Clearwater Revival going into battle <laughs> like they do in the movies? We had a... Uh, what is it, the uh, Robin Williams, uh, Good Morning Vietnam. Vietnam, yeah. We had a channel we could get on and, and hear uh, Mr. Chicken and Good Morning Vietnam and stuff, but you usually were so busy with other radio contacts that you didn't usually get to listen to that. I remember a few times, but maybe just coming back in. I've been intrigued by what the troops in World War II were doing on the landing craft before they landed. You know, were they looking, were they ducked down? What were these troops on your helicopters doing before they landed? Were they sitting? Were they hanging their feet outside? What were they doing? I mean, well, I don't know. We just picked them up wherever we pick them up at, and they—I uh, don't know what they did the uh, ten minutes or the hour before. They just jumped in. You—they got in. Uh, yeah, sometimes they'd have their feet hanging out or whatever, but usually there's 
seat in the back where they'd set so everybody was inside the chopper. You know, it wasn't wasn't maybe as casual as you see in some of these uh, movies where you're just hanging out the side. It's not that quite that casual. And uh, like I say, some of them are brand new, so it was just, you could see the look in their face. It was just, uh, I don't know if anybody can imagine 18 or 19 and have a rifle in your hand and jumping out into a rice paddy where you know, well, you can hear, you can hear shooting. Whether it's outgoing or incoming, you don't know. I mean, it's, it's the real thing right then. I mean, I can't fathom any individual. Uh, I guess everybody's going to react differently. Or maybe everybody reacts the same, I don't know. It's got to be petrifying. Were you scared for your life when you were being shot at, or was it kind of like, we're going to be okay, or I mean, are you just focused on your mission? I think you're focused on the mission, and you're probably, I was probably more conscious of what they were feeling than what I was feeling. I mean, I had that initial sensation when I saw it, but after that, when you kind of did it every day, I think you became more aware of what they were feeling. Did you ever medevac any wounded out? Yeah, we had, we had, yeah, we'd get called in and bring out uh, two or three or four. I mean, it was just, you look in the back and they're on the stretcher and get them out of there. I mean, it's everything you're concentrated is forward and getting out. You know, it's not, you don't do a lot of talking in the back. You might get a glance back like that, but you're, it's all straight for attention. So it wasn't like you're wanting to see what was happening or who was hurt and what happened? Were they screaming or were they... Uh, were they mobilized or what? I mean, usually, uh, no, usually not screaming. Usually, pretty much out of it. By that time, if they're badly wounded, they've been given morphine or something. They're out of it, and they've probably there's probably a medic on the ground, so they've been wrapped up and bandaged. And like I say, thank God I wasn't out in the field. I, I don't believe I would have made it. It's kind of like our flight for life helicopters today. They're going around picking up wounded with their car wrecks or whatever. That whole thing probably was birthed in Vietnam. I mean, that Air Mobile Division, all that. They had an opening for a helicopter pilot up here at St. Mary's, and I actually was going to go put in for it. And uh, due to my injuring my voice, I didn't think I would make it. So, But I think probably Vietnam uh, pilots were probably some of the more qualified. I don't know who actually who's flying it now, but what a beautiful ship it is. It's a big pleasure to fly it, but be the same instance as it. There's been a couple of them lost, you know, wrecked something years back. But that's a, you know, that's a, they're a great machine. They're expensive, but they're, they're fast and they're a, they were really the workhorse over there. They had the Puff of Magic Dragon. They had some big fixed wings and they had the loaches, the observation, but the, the Huey was really the, the dog of the whole thing. I think it really, I'd like to feel that way anyway, because I was there doing it, but the little loaches were, um, Real quick, the little leg beaters. They were great for observation or gunships, but the Huey is a great ship for that, for that war. Have you ever been anywhere recently where Huey's flew overhead? I mean, we'll, uh, Vietnam era Huey's. Have you ever been anywhere like that? I've seen them in air shows that come over, like military. Uh, they'll fly formation right across over here. There'll be six or eight. Yeah, it's a it's a real interesting. I mean, even my boy will run out and look at it. Flying formation, that's quite the feeling. And that was. That was a great feeling when you did it. I mean, you, you had to, everything had to be just perfect. You had to lock into a focus point on a runner or a blade and stay in perfect formation. You really become quite good. You're flying enough hours every day that it just becomes second nature. And I, by the time I was in there just two or three months, I consider myself, you know, a really good pilot. You could just, every ship had a little different feel, but you could set them down so light, take them off so easy, knew the characteristics of what it would take off at one o'clock with certain weight. Uh, you could just make them almost do anything, just almost dance for you. You miss flying today? Well, I do, I really love to fly, and I uh, bought the uh, Bell and never got a, a lot of chance to fly it. It was too expensive, and uh, my insurance actually cost more per month than my payment was on it. If I remember, my insurance was 1300 a month, my payment was 1200 but yeah, I do miss the, uh, the rotary flying. I'd love to have the money and time just to go out and fly every day, you know, under a comfortable situation. <laughs> I'm going to have you do one more thing. I've asked all the veterans to do this, all 200 of them. I want you to give me a salute into the camera. Could you do that when I tell you from right there? You want me to stand? No, I want you sitting down for the camera's sake. I know it's more appropriate to stand, but let me just get focused in here. Okay, sir, right into the camera. Great. Thank you.